Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, October 23rd, and we will hear the presentation, Shared Spaces and Flush Streets, the Potential for Barrier-Free Public Realms. Get to my next slide here. Here we go. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in that chat box and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up next uh, is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all of those participating chapters and divisions for making these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, today we are sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division. So thank you uh, for hosting today's session and we'll hear a little bit more about them in just a moment. Um, coming up next here is a screenshot of our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Um, here's where you'll go to register for any of our upcoming sessions. We do have a bunch of them coming down the pipeline. I just have to kind of plug them all in and get your registration ready. So uh, be sure to head over to our webcast webpage so that you can register for those sessions. And you'll also see um, up at the top here, this is actually a screenshot of our webcast webpage. We have um, some prior webcasts. Um, all of our prior webcast um, slide decks are in PDF format and you can download them there. We have some distance education sessions that are available, um, a couple worth uh, law credit, uh, ethics credits, and then we have a couple general sessions to get all of those check marks off for you. Um, so be sure to, to head over there and uh, check all of that out. Get my next slide. Here we go. Uh, today's session has been approved for one and a half CM credits for live viewing. So uh, if you need to log your credits, just head over to planning.org and log into your My AP account. And from there, you can either search by today's title or the event number. If you don't get a chance to jot them down, they're both on our webcast webpage. Just head over there for more information. And like us on Facebook, just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. Uh, that's where I post anything, uh, immediate information, like a change of a session or if there's a new session available to register for, that's generally where I'll post everything. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We record all of our sessions and post them thereafter. Um, we have over 300 sessions uh, available to view, over 3,000 subscribers. So make sure that you join us so you get notified when we post a new video. That is it for my housekeeping items. I am now going to turn it over to Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division um, to give a quick overview of the division and uh, initiatives and to introduce today's speakers. So Margaret. Hi, thanks very much. Um, welcome from the Urban Design and Preservation Division and we hope you will join the division if you have, aren't already a member. In uh, December, on the next slide, you'll see that um, we're gonna bring you um, a webinar on urban landscape framework and historic preservation. Uh, it'll feature a video with international experts hosted live by Donovan Ripkema and his associate, Brianna Grosicki. In January, we will bring you more of our public art life cycle series entitled Rules, Rebels, and Riots. This, as I said, this is part two, which will focus on maintenance to mayhem. And our presenter will be Sarah Conley Odenkirk, our favorite lawyer. In March, our webinar will be how to nourish longstanding local businesses, which are known as legacy businesses, that are important to not only social fabric, but neighborhood character and community identity. This presentation is created and hosted by Professor Elizabeth Morton with expert, experts Richard Carrillo from San Francisco and Pardis Safari from Cambridge, Massachusetts, both in the um, public sector there. Um, if you'd like to get personal notification of these and other opportunities to participate in our division's activities, join us by becoming a member of the Urban Design and Preservation Division. Our speakers today are Cindy Zerger and Ian Lockwood of Tool Design. 
Cindy is the Urban Design Director of Tool Design's California office. She co-leads Tool Design's Urban Design practice and is, as I said, the Urban Design Director for the company of California offices. She has a broad range of experience from complex urban design projects to large statewide and national initiatives focused on multimodal transportation planning and design. Cindy blends a background in organizational management and leadership with master's degrees and professional experience in both landscape architecture and urban planning. Cindy is passionate about creating exceptional experiences in the public realm, from streetscapes to trails to plazas to parks. She has a keen understanding of the importance of design details and how they contribute to the experiential qualities of a place. You may remember she presented with Ian uh, last year on uh, Pathway as Place. Outside of work, Cindy enjoys cycling, running, reading books on all things design, and going on urban park adventures with her husband and son. Presenting with her is her colleague, Ian Lockwood, who is a livable transportation engineer. Ian is a recognized national leader in sustainable transportation policy and in urban design. He's a former partner in the Orlando-based Gladding Jackson, which many of you may remember, which later became ACOM. Ian led a wide variety of transportation projects aimed at making communities more walkable, bikeable, and transit friendly. He also served as the city transportation planner for the city of West Palm Beach, where he transformed state arterial roads and local roads and the city's approach to parking to help the city overcome its blighted condition and evolve into an economically and socially successful city. Ian's current work includes walkability projects, restoring one-way streets to two-way streets, taming arterials, shared spaces, policy reform, and designing main streets, campuses, and downtowns. Ian has guest lectured at several universities and is occasionally interviewed on NPR. In 2011, he was awarded a Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University during which he studied the links between transportation, land use, and successful outcomes for communities at all scales. In 2018, he was named to Tool Design's Board of Directors. For fun, he enjoys photography, cartooning, and road cycling. So I'm very pleased to present Cindy and Ian uh, to talk to you about shared streets, plush streets, and accessibility considerations. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret, for that uh, uh, fantastic um, introduction. Hopefully you can all see my screen. I'm just going to uh, swap presenter view. Uh, please tell me if it is not uh, showing you the, the full screen, but hopefully it is. Um, Again, thanks for this opportunity, and I'm really excited to see everyone uh, attending and um, our opportunity to, to talk a little bit about shared spaces and flush streets. Uh, uh, of course, with every presentation, a good roadmap is always helpful, pun intended there. Uh, a brief history, we'll go over brief history and principles and applications of shared spaces. Uh, flush streets and how they different, they're different a little bit different than shared spaces and some of the um, elements of them, how we integrate uh, this with open spaces or how they work, relate to each other, and then um, spend some time talking about accommodating people with disabilities because this becomes a hot topic when we're talking about shared spaces. So I'm not going to dwell too much on our backgrounds. Margaret, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, but as, as she mentioned, I uh, have a background in both planning and landscape architecture and really enjoy my passion is thinking about uh, what is our largest uh, part of our public realm, which is our streets uh, in urban spaces. I uh, love to work with Ian Lockwood. We've, we've partnered on a number of projects across the country uh, together and the synergy between his uh, perspective as an engineer and, and coming at it from a sustainable and livable perspective 
uh, coupled with uh, my interest in design it, uh, has been uh, rewarding for us in, in working with communities across the country and, and um, helping people rethink uh, their streets. Um, so without further ado, I'll jump right in. Um, so a little bit of history about shared spaces. Uh, so obviously um, this, this image I think just illustrates that it's not a new concept. Um, the, perhaps um, you know, we didn't even perceive of them as shared spaces at, at, um, years ago, but this was um, how life played out in our streets, in our public realm, in, in cities across uh, the country and across the world. Um, people easily navigated by foot, by bike, or uh, by horse. Um, and uh, it's where social and economic exchange happened um, throughout our, our, our cities. Um, and even with the advent of streetcars, for some, um, it, you know, it's still considered a, a shared space. People could walk when they uh, cross when they wanted to, and, and it really had a self-regulating uh, um, aspect to it, I think, largely because of the way it was designed and, um, and how people uh, respected the space and um, uh, everyone's speeds were slowed at a certain point, at a certain level. Um, so they've been around for thousands of years. Um, they, they have been, um, but the conflicts really started to begin. This slide just illustrates, you know, throughout our history, um, you know, walking was our, our first mode and um, and sort of the importance of accommodating all modes within our spaces has been, has been part of our history. But the conflicts really began about 85 years ago. You can see in the upper right, uh, uh, an image of a public service announcement about 85 years ago when there was more of a modernist transportation agenda. Things were really, you know, in that movement, um, it was about compartmentalizing. And uh, this is when we really started to experience conflicts and tension. Um, so, you know, this is this is what ended up happening to a lot of our streets. Um, the car sort of dominated the, the middle and people were relegated to the edges. And you can see that tension um, still play out in public service announcements, um, as you see here. Um, it's still a tension and source of conflict, I would say, um, even in the modern day era about uh, whether the car has priority or whether people do. And I think the, the important thing that we're, we're, we're seeing now more and more is the importance of, of considering all modes. Uh, it's not just um, one agenda, but it's all modes. And how can we design our spaces to better accommodate all of them and do so in a way that's, uh, that's enjoyable and safe and, and comfortable. I'm going to hand it off to Ian, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the history of shared spaces as well. Thank you, Cindy. So I want to talk about um, the late Hans Bonderman and the late Ben Hamilton Bailey. They were the um, two fellows who really pioneered this idea of shared spaces in, in contemporary times. And uh, Hans was an engineer and Ben Hamilton Bailey was an architect, but really interested in human interactions in the public realm. And they um, didn't like what they were seeing. So that's the next slide. So in the books, they, uh, like the Colin Buchanan's book called Traffic in Town, um, the modernists had, had this idea of, of speed and level service for motors and basically was supposed to be achieved through separation. And this led to some um, not so great outcomes, which you'll, you'll see in a moment. Next slide. And they didn't like the fact that school children were being taught that the streets are for trucks and cars, not for people. And they didn't like these service maps. They didn't like the trajectory of the largest part of the public realm being monopolized so heavily and so dangerously by, by cars. Next slide. And then they, they looked around and they, they didn't like what was happening in terms of design. You, know, you look at those beautiful buildings, but the, but the streets and the signs and, and all the clutter uh, to help um, channel pedestrians to control pedestrians uh, to make way for, um, for motor vehicle use. But they also knew, uh, next slide please, they also knew that um, there were options. There were a lot of streets still around the world where, where all the different modes could interact successfully. And um, Hans term, uh, coined the term shared spaces where, where walkers, cyclists, car users, transit and so forth could use the same space. And they came up with an analogy of uh, the ice rink. And they, they'd like to tell a story about um, an imaginary time where um, ice rinks didn't exist and so skating didn't exist. And, and an inventor came to City Hall one day and said, hey, I've got this great idea. Knowing full well that the city tries to remove ice from public spaces so people don't slip and fall and injure themselves. But he came up to the city council and said, hey, I've got this great idea what if we flooded this whole area with water in the wintertime so it froze and we invite the public to come out with any prior training 
and go out onto the ice. And of course, everyone's shocked at this idea. And he says, and not only that, we're going to we're going to strap sharp steel blades to their feet, and then have them slide along on these on these steel blades with with no lanes, with no with no traffic control, no nothing. And um, and of course, this happens all the time. Um, these ice rinks, and people figure it out easily. They don't smash into each other all the time. The the beginners go next to the edges. Uh, the, the more advanced people go in the middle and do their spins, and everyone else knows, you know, it's just cool to circulate in a clock or a counterclockwise manner, and everyone has a lot of fun. Um, and so he thought, you know, people can figure out these sort of shared spaces um, in these circumstances and other circumstances. So they started building shared uh, spaces in streets. And Hans, um, at his very first ones, he just simply removed the traffic control devices. And interestingly, collisions went down. Uh, motors had to take responsibility for their own actions, and um, there was more of this interaction between folks. And they started formalizing the, these ideas into you know, what we now know as shared spaces. And they come in all kinds of uh, shapes and varieties, which, um, which was Cindy will describe. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. So, um, as as Ian mentioned, you know, it was it was about um, allowing for different interactions or different people to um, it, it be within a space. And so, uh, uh, just a quick definition of what we mean by shared space: it's it, it's a space that really lacks the formal separation often found in our conventionally designed streets. It blurs the line. Uh, between the intended uh, spaces for pedestrians and cars, but it still accommodates all users of the of, of the space. There are some elements that we'll talk about um, in terms of comfort zones and and um, access zones as well. Uh, but they they often typically uh, have no or minimal traffic control devices. So these are just a, a few different examples from the very informal and casual uh, to rural and natural um, and and plaza and and more formal spaces. And I think what what again you know the, the important thing is is it's allowing it to be a slower um, experience and uh, accommodate um, everyone who wants to be in this space so here's an example where several streets really come together into more of a plaza or shared uh, space it's a place uh, for social and ec economic exchange and it's it can be used in a variety of ways um, and, and, and some elements of it, uh, you can see in, in this image here, um, someone in a mobility device and also someone with um, a, a surf a mobility a device in the background also navigating the space uh, barrier free. So it has, they have access to every area of this, of this plaza. P people on bike and walkings uh, also don't have to worry about um, curbs um, and how to navigate that as well. This is a, an example in Point in England. It's a small uh, city in England where county, uh, excuse me, uh, county roads historically came together in the city, in the center of town. Uh, the traffic really grew, um, so you can see the image on the left here, and the inter intersection became signalized, and it was expanded, and it really became uh, the dominating feature of this space. Um, the queuing, car queuing was, was exceptionally bad, and it was felt very unfriendly for people who wanted to cycle or walk um, in the area. Um, ben Hamilton Bailey, as Ian mentioned earlier, he worked with the community and developed this two roundel scheme that you see on the right. Um, so the concept uh, diagram above or, or graphic above and the, and the actual implementation below. And um, initially, you know, there were really mixed feelings about this. People were, were not um, sure this was going to work. And but what 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 happened is even the detractors after it was implemented uh, admitted that it really worked really very well and that they enjoyed it. A queuing went down, became very easy to navigate, a uh, bike uh, and walking uh, was much easier. And the image of the area and the and the community was really improved uh, because it felt very designed and very intentional. Local businesses did better and all modes and stakeholders really benefited. This is another example of a shared uh, space where uh, a number of streets, four streets, um, kind of difficult intersection come together in North Shopping, Sweden. And this is uh, the concept uh, at the top was what was previously there. And you can see um, very controlled um, intersection, but hard to, to really see uh, spaces where people were walking. And so the, the design solution is at the bottom graphic here and really considers or creates this uh, sense of place or a plaza within it. 
you can see from some of the images, um, these are some aerials and we'll show a street view as well, um, that it, it, it allows for a number of different modes um, to move through and, and different size vehicles. Um, it's on a transit line, so it's very easily navigable um, by larger vehicles um, and also uh, pedestrians and, and smaller vehicles who uh, need to navigate the space. This is another image just recently of the space. Um, you can see on the edge there's some design elements that we'll talk a little bit about in a bit um, about um, you know navigating with a mobility device or any sort of um, there's some edge edge treatments that are really important in some of these spaces that we'll talk a little bit more about. And um, Ian loves to point out that even in Europe they they like they like their fast cars and like to drive fast, but um, in spaces where they're very well designed and there's an intention um, to slow people down, uh, people behave well and they really respect uh, the space. So in, in uh, a lot of different um, conversations right now, the question is whether they're, whether we should call them shared spaces or shared streets. And we offer that really it's a shared space uh, because it's inclusive of more than just the street. It's about intersections and integrating other spaces within a community into this uh, space as well. So plazas and squares can all be part of your shared space. Um, there are a couple elements just to call out, uh, the idea of a comfort zone. So again, when it is more of a street condition and you have um, shim sharing, there's still a, an area that we would call the comfort zone uh, where motor vehicle uh, use is really discouraged. It can still be in that space, but it's discouraged. Um, and it's done, it's delineated through different types of materials. You can see the, the warning strips um, here. Uh, and then also, of course, street furnishings in some areas. There's also the shared zone where this is, um, motor vehicle is more encouraged, but also so again, different types of um, people might be navigating this space, uh, walking or biking as well. And um, a flush street is a little bit different, um, but in that there is still um, pretty defined spaces. So there's your parking area, your travel way, and your um, your sidewalks. Um, but they're, these are known as curbless or festival streets. They have some same um, similarities to shared spaces. Um, and these can be um, closed to motorists and used as public open spaces, um, really allowing you to kind of expand um, in communities where you wanna hold larger events um, in the downtown. I'm gonna pass it off to Ian to talk a little bit more about um, flush uh, streets. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so this is a flush street. It's um, the main street at the University of Central Florida. And you can see the design vehicle in the bottom right. Yeah. And that fellow lives in that residence on the left. And he can access everything just like everybody else. Uh, the bookstore, the cafeteria, uh, the football stadium. So it, he can um, he can get around um, in this barrier free environment, and it really helps everybody else. They can have events on the street, and people aren't tripping up and down curbs. You can set up tents and whatever you want on the street. So it's, it's really a truly public space. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a street that we did in front of the uh, basketball arena in Orlando, and you can see all the doors along there. So thousands of people stream in and out of this building during events, and while they're waiting for the event, there's often uh, free event activities happening in the street. And so they, they close the street to motorists um, at those times, and it, and it becomes an instant plaza. Uh, you'll see that in the next slide. And, you know, people just love the space. And so here it is, it's empty, and on the next slide you'll see it, it's, it's busy with events. They have all kinds of things, whether or not there's anything going on in the stadium or not, it's, it's used as a public space. And that garage on the uh, right-hand side has been torn down. And this area has been so successful that they're, they're building a, um, a whole entertainment area. Um, and this, this shared space, or this, sorry, this plus street will, will connect everything together. The next slide shows a university campus. And th there's a busy street going through it called Square, Square One Drive, which leads to the Square One Mall. And uh, plenty of traffic going back and forth and there's plenty of students crossing between the two quads. And by using the, the flush street, the students can cross without having to push buttons or go to crossings because they just wander around it anyway. And, um, and this provides a, a nice, slow and safe environment where, where all the different user groups can coexist and, and function in, in harmony. Next slide. So, um, so here's a Venn diagram which shows the public realm made up of streets and open spaces. Next diagram. And, and there's a subgroup of streets called complete streets, which means that all the different user groups can comfortably use the street. Now, of course, complete streets isn't a, 
like a whole idea because it, it talks just about accommodating people comfortably. You know, things like image and culture and art and stuff aren't part of that definition. Curbless streets, um, there's overlap there as well. Some complete streets are curbless, but other curbless streets aren't um, complete. So there's, that's why there's that overlap. And next slide. And shared spaces are usually curbless. They usually accommodate everyone comfortably, and they overlap with open spaces, as Cindy illustrated with the, um, the example from with Sulphur Springs, which we'll go into more detail in a moment. Next slide. So Sulphur Springs. So Sulphur Springs is a little a city of about 17,000 people in a rural part of Texas. And this is the main street. Um, next slide, please. So Sulphur Springs wasn't doing so great, and they wanted to revamp their, their downtown. And um, they had us come in, and we had a lot of um, community meetings and outreach to really get to people's values, what, what, what really mattered to them. And we used those values to help us uh, reimagine the streets with them and then uh, build the streets. And so there's the before picture of the main street on the left and the after one that you saw a moment ago. And so that's the, the former state arterial um, highway that went through town until the bypass uh, came in. And, and a lot of development moved next to the bypass, which kind of killed the downtown and all the um, goods and services moved out to the bypass. Once we made it into a cool street, the economy came back. And we did other streets too, um, leading, leading to their main square. And so the main square um, looked terrible. Um, it was turned into a parking lot to uh, compete with the, the, the suburbs, and it really failed as a space, and there was only one restaurant open in town when we got there. So we, we worked, again, with the community, with stakeholders, with the property owners, with the, um, the court, which is, which is the courthouse in the background there, and reconceived the space and, and built it, and it looks like this now in front of the courthouse. It's just a beautiful place. And let's go to the aerial view. And you'll see, um, um, coming down from the top of the slide, is a, it's a two-way truck route which splits into a one-way pair, which goes through the balance of the, the downtown. And motorists would, would fly through here, and the whole idea was about levels of service and speed and whatnot, but not about place. And so uh, we two-way all of the streets, and we, um, we made them uh, flush streets. So there's, it's a curbless environment. And that's what it looks like in the after photograph. And so we have this wonderful public space and these small streets so that we can have a, a little event uh, in the uh, square itself. Or if we have a meeting event, we can close one of the streets to motorists and expand the square up to the building. Or for, for July 4th or Cinco de Mayo or some of the larger events, uh, we can use all of the streets and create an enormous uh, public space. But here's an example of an event. And um, they started out modestly because there was nothing going on before, but these events kept growing and the Sulphur Springs became a regional center of social and economic exchange. People came from all over to, to go to this fantastic public space. Next slide. And this is another event. And, and what Cindy and I want to show you here is if you look closely, and we're going to circle them for you, you'll see a whole bunch of folks who are using mobility devices or canes. And there's lots of other people in that crowd, which you can't see in the photograph, who, who, who share some sort of mobility impairment. But the entire space is built for them. Uh, they, they don't have to negotiate curves or slopes or anything like that. So it's a highly inclusive place. And there's a lot of folks whose disabilities you can't see. So uh, there's, there's quite a lot of people who benefit by this sort of um, this barrier-free design. And on the edges, we have these uh, flush streets. And um, so during events, uh, you can um, use this space. And, and during the farmer's market, it's too big for the square now. It's become a huge event. They, uh, they line the streets with um, the tents with all sorts of things, and all sorts of kinds of food for sale. And, and these projects typically have an economic effect. It's not just about making a cool street and inclusive design. It's also about making a great place with identity, which attracts people and investment. And lots of people have now moved to Sulphur Springs um, and started businesses. Um, a lot of the local people have uh, revamped the stores. Like uh, this is an empty, this store had been empty for a long time, and now it's a, a steak restaurant with three 
street condos up on top. So it has a, a large effect on the, um, the pride in the community and the economy. And then um, we're also trying to reach all age groups. And these are, this is what we call uh, free-range children. So the streets downtown now are, are so safe and, and so pleasant that parents feel comfortable letting their kids explore and, and go around town on their own. And you know the, the kids, of course, benefit greatly by not being um, shackled to their, their neighborhood street. So it, it's become a truly inclusive place. And I think that's, um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so summary of the terminology. So we have the shared space, but that lack of um, formal separation, the complete street, which accommodates everybody. The flush street, which is, is like a conventional street, but um, with, without barriers. And, and then the two parts of the shared space, the comfort zones on the edges and the shared zone down, down the middle, usually. And one of the challenges with these projects is without the curbs, um, people with vision disabilities have difficulty navigating. So we spent a lot of time studying all the available technologies and practices to, to ameliorate that problem. And we've got um, a, a nice summary of how to approach that for everybody. There's really two main tactile um, technologies available for us. There's directional indicators, which, which guide people along a certain path, and then there's warning surfaces. And the idea is to use both of these um, effectively um, to, to guide people to places and through the public realm and even through big buildings like airports and um, train stations. Next slide, please. And we think of it kind of like Morse code where they have dots and dashes. You know, with just dots, it's not very useful. But with dots and dashes, you can communicate a lot very quickly, effectively, simply, and consistently to, uh, to folks in a myriad of contexts. And you'll, you'll see some of that coming up. Next slide. So this is a, um, an arterial street. And it's got a, a light rail line running down the middle of it. And how does somebody who can't see find the crossing, the mid-block crossing? So these tech guys help people find the crossing and get to the, to the light rail. Next slide. So this is a um, train station. And there's an entire tactile network uh, built into the floor. And most people don't notice it, but if, if you can't see, you can follow this from the transit stop to the ticket windows, to the gates, to everything that's important, uh, you, can, you can find your way. Um, to that large building. This is at the airport, and you can see the directional indicators bringing people to a uh, information kiosk. And there's a button there for people who can't see, and they can get all the same information that anyone else can get by um, a, a sequence of button pushes. Next slide, please. So these are what we call delineator strips, and um, there's a lot of research and work done in New Zealand about how to, to demarcate the the edge of the street. And um, how it works in New Zealand is that there's about a two meter wide or six foot wide strip down the sides of the streets where um, people with vision disabilities are encouraged to use. Most of the folks in New Zealand who can't see uh, follow the building line. And, um, and if they veer um, towards the dangerous part, you have the delineator strips. Now these are not for directional guidance. They're really just to let folks know where you, where it's safe to walk and where it's not safe to walk. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things is that these delineator strips um, were championed by mostly urban designers for um, aesthetic and design reasons. They wanted them to look good, but also do their job for people who can't see. Now, one of the downsides of what, when we visited the area to um, look at these is that some of the things that folks might want to use are on the, um, the so-called danger side of the delineator strips. And so obviously folks who can't see would, would be discouraged from trying to find those uh, benches and um, recycling bins and that kind of thing. Next slide. One of the things that we really did like about what they did in New Zealand was that they had a, a different tactile warning surface for just the edge of the street and crossings. And in North America, we often use 
the truncated domes for everything. So it's very confusing for people who can't see to know where there is a crossing. And if you were to cross the street and you couldn't see about, if you're about halfway down the street and you cross the street, you might end up hitting that um, little hedge on the, on the left and, and not knowing how to get to the, uh, to the sidewalk. So it, it takes folks to where they, where they would probably want to cross. Next slide. So let's put it all together. So we, um, we looked at all kinds of um, guides from around the world and came up with a, a vocabulary which we have put together, which we think applies to most contexts that you would find on streets and public spaces in, in North America. And the idea begins with what we call the basic pedestrian access route. And this is about a, a six foot wide space with enough space for a wheelchair to navigate a directional indicator and then an offset. And we put the directional indicator towards the shared zone side of the access route and away from the, the comfort zone or building site, a building side, um, so that the, the folks using wheelchairs can access all the stores and things that you might find on the side of the street and, and their wheels don't um, hit the directional indicator, which isn't, um, isn't desirable. But it also allows somebody who can't see um, to use the directional indicator in a number of different ways. Um, some, some folks who we work with like to put their left foot on, on the directional indicator to find their way. Some people use their right foot. Some people walk right on top of it. And, and some people just um, sweep it or tap it with their, their cane. So this is what we think is the best or minimum arrangement to accommodate um, people with mobility impairment and people with visual impairment. The next slide, please. But what happens when there's bends or junctions? And so after a certain angle of turn, we put a, um, a warning strip to let folks know that the, um, the route that they're following is taking a sharp turn or that they've arrived at a T intersection or a four approach intersection. Next slide. And the, and the kind of the last part of that vocabulary is that when a directional indicator ends, it's, it's a cool idea to end in a warning surface so that, that the person who is using it to navigate knows that they've either arrived at a crossing or at the top of an escalator leading down to the subway or a door to an important building or something like that. And how do you apply this to streets? And so for Flush Street, uh, what, we, what we do is we built in the delineator strip into what we call the furniture zone. And that's where the, the landscaping is, benches, um, newspaper racks, lights, all of, um, you know, uh, places to put your scooter, all these sorts of things are in the furniture zone. And then we have the uh, pedestrian access route, um, and it can go pretty well anywhere in the sidewalk, but for this example, it's next to the furniture zone. And then you have typically a retail zone. And one of the things we like about this is that it, it gives folks with any sort of disability a pedestrian access route to follow, and you, you're not relying on a, a clean, continuous building line to follow because in North America, often the, the buildings don't follow a straight line. Some are set back a little more than others. Some have door swings that come into the sidewalk. Others have um, tables and sandwich signs and other sorts of things out on the side of their building. So it, it gives a, a, a nice predictability for people who can't see to, to with something to follow. Next slide. And this is for a, a shared space. And one of the characteristics of a shared space is that kind of that ambiguity that Cindy was talking about between um, where you drive and where you walk. And, and so the, the delinear strip is, is deliberately made to fit in more for people who are sighted. But for people who can't see, it, it provides that clear tactile edge to the, the, what's the comfort zone. And then we, similarly, we still have the session access route issue there. Um, for people with disabilities, even though um, on a shared space, you can walk around anywhere you want, but um, for folks who can't see, uh, the, um, the guidance is, is very helpful. And next slide. So at intersections, this, um, at intersections of um, flush streets, you still have crossings and so forth, not so much for shared streets. But for flush streets, you still have that similar vocabulary that you would have at a, at a regular street with traffic control devices. So this shows how the, um, the guide strips and the warning strips come together and help 
pedestrians get to the crossings. And then one of the things that we've um, been working on is how does somebody cross the street who can't see? And um, there's this tendency to veer sometimes. So we've put a crossing delinear strip on each side of the crosswalks. And, and the key is that you got to make sure that material can um, withstand, you know, truck tires and car tires and, you know, plows and all these sorts of things. And the, um, the material of choice that, um, that they worked on in New Zealand was a cut um, cobble granite. Um, so it was very durable and it could be used in, in pretty well any sort of circumstances. So that's how you would do the crossing. And this, um, now this isn't part of the, the talk, but we are trying to develop something where folks with vision disabilities can find a way to the public realm. Uh, but we also wanted to show that it's very consistent with roundabouts, where that's uh, another a tricky place for people with vision disabilities. I just want to point out the main feature here is the audible paving on the approach um, from the circulating part of the roundabout towards the crossing. So in this way, even roundabouts become legible and navigable for people with vision disabilities. And I'm going to pass this um, on back to Cindy, and she's going to show you some examples of how to apply this in real life situations. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so we just have a couple of examples here um, and uh, ways we are, are starting to think through this is if we have the opportunity to to retrofit um, shared spaces, what are some different design moves that you can do to make it more accommodating of all who need to navigate a space? So um, as we talked about before, there's these this, this sense of a comfort zone on the edges and then a shared zone through the middle. Um, so the first thing would be to identify uh, desired pedestrian ac access routes, often located closest or closer to the buildings than, say, the shared space. Uh, so defining those, you know, figuring out what those might be uh, through a, through a street um, is a is a good exercise. And then, uh, if you have any sort of obstacles, um, thinking about how they could be moved, or thinking about uh, where you should place them relative to those um, desire lines, so shifting them as needed. Um, then being able to, within that um, uh, pedestrian zone, plan out your directional indicators and junctions and bends and destinations like Ian mentioned. And in some instances, you know, the building to the left here might be, uh, it's, a, it's a bank. And so uh, there might be some civic uh, buildings within your community where you do want to allow for uh, the, the bends and junctions to actually access the, the storefront in that, in that situation. So um, you can see on the left there, not only is the uh, delineator, uh, the directional indicator going across, along uh, a pathway, the desired um, pedestrian route, but then also into um, key buildings as needed. Uh, so then you implement the guidance and, and you know, right now we're using orange as an example just to really highlight this. But um, as we've shown, I think there's a number of materials and we're seeing new more and more of this happening where uh, materials can really be aesthetically pleasing. They don't have to be a fixed and, and bright yellow. They, I think there is some benefit to contrasting colors uh, for some folks, uh, but how, how much so um, is still um, something to, to consider and, and, and also the light of this or the durability, I guess, of the material is really important as you think about implementing these or in integrating them into your uh, street spaces. Uh, and then we Im implement the delineator strips as well. Um, so this is a, a concept that we developed for a town in Texas, uh, which would incorporate uh, a sidewalk level, or this is a flush street actually, so all everything is at one level, uh, but we have a bikeway, a specific bikeway, uh, pedestrian route, of course, and then travel way. And so in thinking about how we we could improve upon our own designs. Um, what are some things that we, we should consider? Again, that idea of that access route that um, Ian mentioned, that 36 inches really defining what that needs to be and where it could be, um, and then figuring out where to place that uh, directional indicator within that space so that people um, can use it um, appropriately and it doesn't uh, in, um, run into any of the obstacles or is it, is it creates a direct routing uh, opportunity. And then, uh, of course, the implementation of that, and again, to key buildings, and then thinking about um, that uh, that edge treatment again um, as well, so that there's a clear um, space where there's a warning strip um, as well. Uh, 
So in this space, again, a, a, a flush condition um, and quickly identifying, again, the, the, um, the pedestrian route or the desired route um, within this, probably not just adjacent to building edges because of uh, the spillout space, the cafe and the retail spillout space. Uh, and then simply implementing a different a change in material um, and uh, the directional indicators. So some examples of that. So in North America, this is um, a, a laundry list of, of, of some different ways it's being implemented um, and some ways that we could encourage uh, better use of this. So in North America, we typically only use the warning surfaces and provide limited information and guidance for people with vision uh, disabilities. These are the ones shown in white text. Um, by using directional indicators and delineator strips, we can provide them with navigation uh, capabilities to a myriad of places and contexts, which are shown in yellow here. And, and we can do that in a simple and consistent manner. So uh, in terms of um, designing for all in these spaces, you know, there's four really simple ideas, we would say. Provide at least the basic pedestrian access route, indicate the changes along the way, and then end in a directional indicator. Uh, really differentiate uh, between the edges and decision points for folks um, as they're navigating a space. So we'll end with a simple idea that it shares or, or an idea that it shared spaces are really, um, a, a, you know, sh simple principles, but, but limitless potential. Um, they allow for great interaction and creating spaces that, um, you know, can be larger than they actually are designed for. And, uh, but to, it's really important to the design of this is are the material cues to reinforce behavior, um, the appropriate behavior and the, and the, um, again, the, the sort of designing for people to um, navigate uh, the space as they as they want to and and the application can be at multiple scales and in different types of places from parks and plazas to streets and campuses so with that uh, we'll say thank you for this opportunity and we'll end there and I know we'll have uh, a good opportunity for some questions and answers I'm gonna um, turn our uh, screen back on I think that's how I do it Christine I think um, let me know if there are any questions. Yes. Um, we we do, we have many. Hold on, I'm gonna, I can't do two things at once. <laughs> Let me get my And And out. I, am I, am I presenting the way I should be? No. Um, no, if you could go ahead and put it into presentation mode. Um, should be good. And we have lots of great questions. Um, Oops, there you go. Great, perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, the first one is, uh, yes, we will have a copy of this presentation available um, at the conclusion of the session on our webcast webpage, and we'll also have a recording available. Just search planning webcast on YouTube. So let's get that out of the way because we had several of those questions. Um, okay, first question. In a time when businesses are being sued for not providing bollards to prevent collisions with pedestrians and autos in parking lots, uh, how has this concept fared? I start with that one? Um, yeah, please. So Ben Hamilton Bailey, you know, one of the founders of this whole thing, um, he, had a, he has a great line he used all the time and he said if you treat drivers like imbeciles they'll behave like imbeciles and if you treat them with respect and create a an environment you know that connotes slow speeds and so forth they'll behave themselves and the idea of bollards are um, sort of fortifying the edges which sends a excessively strong message that this is really dangerous over here and it's really safe there and so we're trying to not use any bollards in our designs now. Um, we actually think of them as a, um, we used to use them, but um, there's a lot of problems uh, with them. And um, so we're trying to not use them now because um, they send that wrong message. Plus if a motorist backs into a bollard when they're parking and damage it, it's very expensive to fix. Um, we don't think um, they offer any additional safety benefits. In fact, they may do the opposite because folks on bikes hit them and fall down. Um, you know, people walk into them during events. Uh, they're just another obstacle in the street that, I, that you don't have to have. So um, yeah, we would discourage people from using them and to use other cues to, to change behaviors. And, 
And if they're not using them in, in parking lots, that's a um, that's a that's a different animal. So we're we're talking about shared spaces and flush streets. Denise, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it. Thanks. Okay. Um, if flush streets work so well, then why in um, one of your examples was curbing introduced? Um, and the person asking the question says, I suspect civil engineers may argue that curbing better controls the stormwater runoff um, than a flush street with no curbing. So could you talk a little bit about that? That's okay, a, that's I'll, a I'll, or do you want to start great question. Time? Sure, I might start it and then I'll pass it off to you. I think um, the curbing in, in some areas you're seeing, I think you're uh, particularly re referencing the um, the Sulphur Spring example and our, our, our project actually also in Texas, in Denison, Texas, will introduce a curb stop uh, for the parking spaces um, as they're needed. And then of course, at areas where uh, we're introducing landscape, that is a really important feature for be able to clearly, um, we use valley gutters and then allow for the water to run into the area around in the in the in the landscaped areas, um, so that's an important aspect. And I think there's also an aspect of uh, making sure reinforcing the I, I don't want to call it channelization, but the the flow of direction um, for uh, pedestrians that can really help at intersections if um, as needed. I, I think Ian, you can speak to that a little bit more um, from the Sulphur Springs example. Yeah, the curb stops we use when we use um, diagonal parking. Uh, when we use parallel parking, we don't have any curb stops or anything like that. But the um, <clears throat> we introduced curbing around the, the trees, um, and and so that drivers actually just don't drive over the landscaping material and the ground cover. Um, on the end of parking rows, usually we'll have a little curb area around the tree, and we're not intending people to walk there anyway. So it still functions as a, a flush space, but it protects the plants. And it also gives the drivers who use the, the last space in the row a tactile guide of where to, to not drive anymore and so you can bump into it without damaging um, the plants or compacting your soil or even getting stuck. Um, we use a lot of um, rain gardens now. And so they have a, um, a lower area. And um, so it's just smart to put um, a curbing around it. And at the... Um, at the approach on a flush street to a crossing, often we we want a, a curved area for the landscaper around it, but we want that six inch edge to provide another means to guide the person who can't see across the street. And so that we align that edge with the directional travel of travel. So um, a flush street in a shared space doesn't mean that there's never any curves, but the curves that are used are, are where you, you want them and not where they create barriers for farmers markets or festivals or other sorts of things. Okay, uh, let's stick with Sulphur Spring for a moment. How did the city finance this major and what appears to be expensive revitalization project? So um, we showed you two streets, the main street and Connolly Street, both of which were completely reconstructed and then an entire square. And um, their setup is a little bit different than most um, uh, governments. They, um, their public works department has um, the ability to do construction work themselves. So they don't contract out a lot of their work. So the, the, the people from Sulphur Springs built most of that themselves with their own hands at a much lower cost than you would um, normally do with contractors. They did contract out some of the stuff that their public works department just simply doesn't do often, so they don't have that capability. But for the most part, it was built by people in the town. And the, the entire project, I think, cost six and a half million dollars, which, which is incredibly low when you consider the, the enormous amount of just things that underground, you know, for the music and for the lights and the sprinklers and the, and the, and the, um, the public restrooms and all these sorts of things. But yeah, they, they took out a, um, it, it's like a um, tax income and financing kind of loan where they took out a loan and um, and the with the uptick in the value of the area, the increased taxes helped pay off the uh, the, the loan. Um, but yeah, they were very creative. Um, it took them uh, probably they took them two years to do the square. They did it in two phases, and um, the other two streets. Um, 
uh, happen independently from the square. So that's how it was financed. I might offer on some other projects that are very similar in a flush condition. Uh, we uh, we've worked with communities where they have created what's called a, a tax in increment reinvestment zone, sort of TERS, and that's been very helpful. Um, it's sort of exactly what Ian was talking about: um, the ability to take some of the, the taxed money um, and uh, capture that um, tax revenue and invest it in the public realm. Okay, um, this is sort of I'm. Um, this first part of the question is teeing up a couple other questions. Um, for projects like these, what is the preferred material? Asphalt, cement, is it sort of dependent upon the situation? That's that's a great question. Um, I, I think uh, all of the above uh, can be applied, can be used. Um, it really depends on the context and sort of the, the local, um, uh, what's worked there. I would say in um, Texas, uh, in one project that we're working on there, um, the reuse of local brick uh, is forming the street. Um, in some areas where you have uh, high levels of truck traffic, uh, concrete is probably going to be your preferred, reinforced concrete is probably going to be preferred. I'd say asphalt is probably the least preferred um, from a, a, a durability perspective and a maintenance aspect. Um, concrete and, and brick are going to be a more uh, durable material and of course it has to do with how you develop your sub base and your sub substructure as well um, those will be important aspects I, I would add that um, the the material is important from a speed management perspective uh, we like the the brick and the cobble and that kind of thing because it provides a texture which helps keep the speed down and to keep the speed in control it, it control it's just not one thing the texture helps, um, but the width of the lanes help as well. Um, you want them to be narrow, and you want a sense of enclosure so people feel contained. And, um, and one of the things, I'll use the Sulphur Springs example since you've seen pictures. If you remember when you're looking down Connolly Street, you had a nice view of the courthouse. But we obsessed about views, like down the street, and then when you get close to the courthouse, you could see a monument that we had put in. Um, and it, it encourages motorists to focus on the near and middle distance and not far away like you would on an interstate highway, which, which makes you want to go faster. So we use all of these cues to modify their behavior. And before, now keep in mind, this is a state road and it's a truck route. Um, and still, by using these, what we call cross-section changes, we can modify people's speeds. And before they speed through all the time, but there's no speed limit signs. There's, they don't even need enforcement. Um, the self-regulates and it's fine. The fire department can still get through, the, the trucks can still get through, um, but they do so on the terms of the place as intended based on the values of the community that were expressed in, in our design. Okay, so um, what happens in particularly this question is referring to the, the, like the tactile warning surfaces when um, utility companies come through and have to work underground and it gets all torn up um, and their response is to just lay a little bit of asphalt back down um, how, how does that work do you know it, it, do you replace it do they replace it um, what is the cost to maintain when utilities have to get underground underneath some of these surfaces well i'll, I'll start um... So when we do these sorts of streets, um, we like to build what we call a 25-year street where you don't have to dig it up. And in the Sulphur Springs example, um, a lot of there was there were places where buildings had either fallen down or were torn down. It was it was quite dilapidated. Um, there were places where there was nothing. Um, and in these sorts of places, when we redid the street, we stubbed out all the utilities to all any place that could possibly de free develop, it's so cheap when the street is dug up just to just sub these things out into the property. And so that's what we did. And so if anybody needs to connect, they can connect at that time. It's all it's always a good idea to do a, a, a good look at what's under the street and replace whatever might be close to its end of its life. So you minimize any of these um, dig up issues. And and that's one of the advantages of using the bricks because um, 
instead of, um, or, or even concrete because it usually comes in squared. And instead of just um, like asphalt, you talk out of the asphalt, you, you do your thing, you put it back, but it looks patched. With bricks, you can take the bricks up, do the work, put the bricks back, and it looks just like it did before. So that that would be my response is to use good quality materials and then you can do necessary work. Like um, one of the things that we do often is in the furniture zone, we put our light utilities in there and they, they're the ones that um, you, you need to do more maintenance on than others. And it's really easy to pick up the, the pavers or the bricks, fix it and then put it back. And the, the street always looks fine. And you know, over time you want that patina anyway, so it looks a little bit, um, it doesn't look completely brand new. Um, so it's okay, and it, it, it handles the maintenance um, very well. Okay. Um, you you mentioned creating these streets for like a tw a twenty five year lifespan. Um, well, up here in um, at least in Northeast Ohio, and those of us in our northern climates where we have a lot of free thaw cycles. Um, this can contribute to premature degradation of sidewalks and just any of these tactile surfaces, um, creating all kinds of problems um, just from buckling where it, it might um, become uh, bad for, the, for those who are just trying to walk or just in terms of the maintenance of it. Um, and I know you mentioned the brick, but um, outside of that, how, how do you manage? Would you have examples of some of this, the shared curbless streets in, in, in the climates where we experience a lot of snow, a lot of ice, um, and and how do you? That's part one, and then part two is how do you manage the snow removal and the winter maintenance on some of these more, I guess, intricate surfaces. So how would I start, Cindy? Did you want to add to sure. your avid skier and lived in a cold place for a long time? <laughs> Um, so we're doing a shared space in Edmonton, Canada, and it doesn't get cold in that. They already have snow, by the way. It was minus, my sister lives there, and they've got, um, it was like minus 10 the other day. <laughs> so um, so it, it happens. Uh, Cindy just showed a slide of a place in Sweden. I hear they get snow. I haven't been there. Um, but um, it happens all over. The... Um, the, the, the cool thing about flush spaces and, uh, or sorry, flush streets and shared spaces, you don't have these little obstacles like curbs. So they're actually easier to plow because you don't have to plow up on top and at the bottom. It's easier to clean away the um, snow drifts. Um, in a lot of places, they get a lot of snow. They can't store the snow all the time. And so every once in a while, they have to come and, and collect it in trucks and tr take it to snow disposal facilities or somewhere else. And um, so the flush, um, streets and the shared spaces are actually superior to conventionally designed streets. But the key is how you drain the street so you don't get that freeze thaw, thaw thing. And you know, with climate change and so forth, a lot of northern climates are getting much more freeze thaw than they, they used to. So um, we use what's called a valley gutter. And usually streets, conventional streets, they have a crown on them and the, the water goes to the, the curb. And the curb is a, a drainage invention. Uh, but what we do and um, where the parking rows are, we actually tilt the other way and the water drains to a valley gutter between the parking row and the first lane on each side. And, um, and then it goes down the valley gutter to either a rain garden or a catch basin or something. But those valley gutters are much more accessible to maintenance vehicles and they can be plowed easier and whatnot. And so they don't get blocked as often. When you have a cash base in the corner of a parking, um, like a ball boat at the end of a parking row, it can get clogged up really easily. So by putting the drainage in the, the right spot, you can have um, it maintained more easily. And it's also good because when you don't have the curb, you, you need to be able to transmit a certain volume of water and you want it away from the buildings. You know, this is a flush space after all, and you don't want any flooding in the buildings because you're, you're dealing with finished floor levels and whatnot. So you want the drainage at, at the edge of the travel lane. And in some cases, uh, but not in cold climates, but we, we sometimes use a center uh, drainage system. But uh, in, in, on the whole, it's easier for sweeping and plowing with these types of streets. Uh, 
and I'll just use the example of uh, the plow for a second. With the valley gutters between the parking row and the first lane, the the grit, um, you know, a lot of people put salt or some sort of brime or some something on the ground, often with sand or grit in it. That migrates to the valley gutter where it can be swept up. Otherwise, it goes against the curb behind parked cars. It's, easy, it's harder to get. So overall, it's um, the shared spaces and the plus streets are superior for, for maintenance um, than compared to a conventional street. Cindy, do you have anything you want to add? I think I would just add, you know, um, you know, a, a, a one example that um, I've worked on, it's not a shared spe space, but, uh, or um, a flush street, but um, a sidewalk level protected bikeway along uh, adjacent just to a sidewalk. And so that whole con condition is flush. And I say, um, you know, the freeze thaw cycles are real and um, there's different materials in that, in that cross section, we have concrete brick, and porous asphalt. And so um, understanding and knowing your materials, um, having someone uh, know them really well and um, is really important. And that preparation of subgrade, I know I'm getting a little into the weeds, but the preparation is really, really important so that your your heave thaw, your heave or your, your sort of uh, expansion and contraction um, is allowed for and accommodated in the design. I would also say, you know, um, one of the questions I think was related to or uh, on this is around the warning surface. So any of those directional indicators or the or the truncated domes and um, oftentimes the, the material that's affixed um, so it's like a plastic that's applied those are going to fail your quickest um, I'm seeing more and more types of materials some of you know the, the warning uh, the tactile do domes are you know you can get a, a metal uh, panel um, and so using really durable materials is important um, and think and I think a lot of fabricators even of bricks now are creating a, a modular brick um, that has that um, the bumped or the rippled surface and I think we'll see more and more of that as there's more demand for this um, so uh, those are really important again using durable materials and and preparing your subgrade okay thank you um, next question how should we deal with the conflict between uh, ADA planners who insist on bright contrast in colors and designers who want space delineation to look and feel as subtle as possible. So I guess part one is, do you agree with these statements? And then part two is, how do you deal with that conflict? You want to start on this one, Cindy? Do you want sure. To yeah, I'll start on this one, and then I know you'll add to it. Um, that's a great question. I'm one of those who who grapples with, oh man, I want it to look really aesthetically pleasing, but I also want it to be really functional for everyone who navigates the space. So I think it's a um, it's a it's a balancing act. I think there are um, some ways to work with your fabricators and work with material um, providers um, to come up and innovate around this. I think the contrast is very important because we know sightedness is a gradient is a is a, is a, a scale um, a sliding scale and so some people can can distinguish between color and the more it's contrasting the better it is I don't know that we have to go all the way and always use the yellow but there are um, some some aspects of that so I say it's 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 definitely something I think we still have work um, to do on to create and use the right materials um, and um, you know there's some some I, I'd say I'm doing some research every day on different streets uh, on the I'm here near in San Francisco on the Embarcadero, and there's an interesting way they've used a cobble, um, same color, but it's it's actually way more pronounced than the New Zealand example Ian Ian provided. And and then I think is that the right thing? Um, it's a little bit different in color, but then then is it a tripping hazard for others? So I think there's still some some ways that um, we can advance that. Ian, anything to add? Yes. Um, so on a lot of our streets. Uh, on the sidewalk, we we like to use um, just a brushed concrete, um, even if other parts are, are brick, especially with flush streets and just regular streets. And our furniture zones, we typically use a material that that's a change in texture, a change in color, and a change in shade. Because some some people who are legally blind can actually see some color, and some can see some shade, and so that's helpful. And um, and some folks who are blind actually don't have any feeling in their feet. So tactile is just not enough sometimes uh, for a, a small population. Um, so we try and use all three when we can. And um, and, I, and I, I have the same quandary as, as Cindy does. I want it to look beautiful and I also want it to be navigable. You know, I had an uncle who was, who was blind and um, 
you know, I would like him to be able to navigate. And my father used a wheelchair, so I, I don't want um, him at odds either. So I, I think some places the contrasting and so forth is more important. And I think it's a judgment call. It's not one size fits all. Um, like a lot of crossings, I think the, 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 the brighter um, truncated domes make sense. But on those um, delineator strips, um, I think it's, it's, it, the, the aesthetics takes a, a, a higher um, importance. So I, I think it's, um, it's something that we have to use our judgment and, and best practices on. And I think we're developing that now. We're de we're, I think we're starting to understand these types of streets uh, better than we ever have. And so I, I think a, be a, a best practices will emerge from what we're talking about. So with that, um, referring to delineator strips and directional indicators, when will these types of additional treatments become commonplace here? <laughs> so that's, that's actually a funny question because um, you, we're all allowed to do that right now. There's nothing preventing anyone from doing this today. And um, you, you've been able to do it for a long time, uh, but the um, to, to make it required requires a lot of approvals by different boards and so on. And um, innovation always leads to legislation um, in these sorts of circumstances. And so we're as a profession, we're going to need to try these things, experiment with these things. Um, monitor them, gather the data, and um, and share it, and so that we can see what works best and what doesn't work. Uh, but what we do know, if we don't use these things, that folks with vision disabilities are highly disadvantaged, and we have an, uh, an inequity out there in the public realm. So we're trying to advance these things um, routinely, and we, we're doing our homework. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I think everybody should do that. And eventually, um, there'll be enough critical mass and enough information to, to give folks who are maybe uh, late adopters, who might be super cautious about this sort of thing and who are worried about tort liability and that kind of thing, um, those sorts of folks can, can come in later and apply it to their cities. But if you, if you do, if you use the best information you have, um, have a good process, document why you did things, and monitor it, there's almost no exposure to tort liability. And so that's the, that's, that's the way we approach it. You have to do those three things. Cindy, any thoughts on that? No, I would just maybe offer that um, the additional part that I think is really enriching and helpful is um, some focused conversations. So we've had the opportunity to work with, say, the Access Board or um, different groups and go out to uh, Woonerfs. Um, there's one that we did in or we went out and did a, a session um, with folks um, to really understand some of the uh, mobility uh, challenges in shared and uh, spaces and more flush conditions. And I think um, it's through that innovation and then that evaluation and understanding uh, that the dialogue needs to be there to advance the design and make sure it's accommodating what we want to what we're setting out to accommodate so um, those are the most enriching I think for continuing the innovation like Ian mentioned I think so important um, to to take a risk at times um, especially if it, you feel like it's going to advance um, and go and go and and make it more comfortable for everyone and then again evaluation is really important yeah, Cindy, Cindy brought up something. Um, I think you're referring to the um, research we did in, in Minnesota. Um, but we also got a, a group of volunteers in Seattle who, who were all blind and walked around streets with them as well, and another time in D.C. And you know, we've spoken to people who were part of the experiments in New Zealand and, and whatnot. And we just need to gather more of this information and um, and talk to people who can't see and how and, and how they're feeling and how they experience these spaces because um, it, it's it's not the same for us um, as it is for them. So it's important to work with them. So uh, this is an interesting question. How do you train people so they know how to navigate the space, especially those? with impairments? Um, or is it just a, you know that the space is working because people organically flow through it without the need to be trained? 
Is that a, I, I wonder if that's specifically around um, people with sighted imp or impairments, or if it's if, if it's for everyone. I think I would offer that um, it's it doesn't take a training. Um, that's the interesting thing about a design that's um, less, uh, I guess, uh, signs and and um, pro, you know has a lot of different um, uh, things within it. I think it's more about uh, people learn um, what how to navigate themselves. I mean, your first your first um, uh, kind of responsibility is take care of yourself. And so you figure out how to navigate it for yourself. And I'd say, um, you know, just through the materials, again, um, the, the, the way you design the space really has that self-policing effect or self-regulating effect, I would say. And I know you have some thoughts on that as well. So one of the things um, that we've learned is that, you know, people who have um, dogs to help them navigate, that the dog is trained to look for certain use like double white lines and these kinds of things. And um, so I think what we're we're trying to do with everything we show today is, is add um, uh, guidance and not remove what they already have. Now what we are removing is the curves. Um, but often the curves are are not necessarily in the ideal place where you, you want people to, to go find them like at the edge of a um, furniture zone or something. So I think I think that the big thrust of this is to provide additional guidance for folks, and I think most people would be able to um, pick up on the changes and, and have a positive response. But I also think um, and a lot of folks who who like I've, um, we were talking to Cindy and I were talking to a guy in California who went blind when he was 18 years old and. You know, he had to learn how to navigate differently. So uh, a lot of the folks in that situation go through training and um, and it would just have to be added to the training that they, they get. And, you know, <laughs> I'm still having trouble, but my kids are training me how to use this thing. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up with a rotary phone, you know, and so I think we can all learn new things and and this does so much more than my own phone does. And um, and these streets will will perform way better than conventional streets. So I think it's okay to um, to um, increase the the training need a little bit. Uh, but I think it's an, it's an additive thing, but we should help people. Um, and I thought I think most people, like as Cindy said, will just consider it out quite quickly. What are the implications, if any, um, on um, herbless streets in terms of autonomous vehicles? Um, just uh, for in terms of what they look for, what is kind of programmed into these vehicles? Um, do they look for curbs when you know they're auto maneuvering? Is this something? Some of these new innovations in street design um, do do we need to be coordinating with? you know, some of these companies that are producing not just autonomous vehicles, but anything autonomous, whatever that be. Do you want to go first, Cindy, or do you want me to go first? Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, so we're, we're involved in a lot of um, reconfiguring downtown streets, and the allocation of public space is, is changing. Um, a lot more emphasis is put on micromobility, sidewalks, trees, these sorts of things, and a lot of space is being removed from, from cars. And um, one of the things that is being um, thoroughly discussed is uh, parking. And that in the, in the past, it was all about a row of parking on each side. And curb management is going to be increasingly important in cities. How do, what is the, who gets curb access, who doesn't, where does it go, where do you place it? And um, so it's not going to be just parking in the future. It's going to be a lot of this pickup drop off, um, either autonomous or not. You know, we're already seeing it with Lyft and Uber having to, to actually allocate places for pick up, quick pick up and drop off and so on because they're blocking lanes and, and whatnot. And um, so we have to make this legible for everybody and I think a lot of the cues that we'll be using will be able to be um, programmed in 
we haven't actually reached out to the, the folks who are doing autonomous vehicles, but there are, they're all like, for example, we're doing a big shared space project on Peachtree Street in Atlanta, you know, just like a super important um, street there. And some of the things that we're, we're dealing with is there's a lot of um, relationship between the street and some of the office buildings. There's a lot of places where there's loading and so on going on. And all of these things have to be rethought through. Um, and this, this whole tax, you know, before it was just taxi stands and, and parking. But, um, but I, think, um, I think we just have to make things legible. And they'll, those very smart people in Silicon Valley will be able to figure out how to get the car to, to recognize it. But yeah, I'd love to work with them on it. Um, so far, we haven't had, had, had the, the need. But um, yeah, I, th I think it will be achievable. I would just offer that, you know, there's a lot of different technology that's used to detect uh, things from LIDAR, radar, to optical cameras, to just, you know, different types of technologies that are embedded into the car. And the way I understand it, again, I'm not an expert, but is how you um, how you embed any of that sensor material into the environment. I mean, some things will be, are embedded like the lane departure things, uh, elements. Um, so there could be some of that, that's sort of smart technology embedded into our streets, um, certainly is, is one aspect I'm sure will there'll be some research and then again as the cameras are taking in environmental um, aspects you know uh, understanding um, you, you know even valley gutters how they how they navigate that space so there's some 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 I think evolution of bo on both sides that would probably need to happen okay thank you um, next question oh this one this one's good um, so an important feature of bus rapid transit stations is level boarding, which is often facilitated by taller curbs. Um, how can these tall platforms be integrated with or complement um, the shared street? Go ahead. Um, no, so, you go, um, ahead. I, I have... <laughs> go ahead. So, um... Where we need to create a, um, a a tall curb, we we will, and um, but the shared space and and the flush street are, are for the length of the street, and so you know where you have platforms, you might have to change the platform to to provide that sort of access, and um, the key is sensitively. Um, a transition between the platform area and the rest of the street and the, and the sidewalk and how you handle that. Um, and things like separated bike facilities, which you can find on plus streets, but not necessarily in shared spaces, um, where that is located and, and how you how you deal with the, the ramps to make up those uh, changes. Um, I think the from the perspective of the people who can't see, it's actually a little easier using the, those um, tactile guidance because you can guide them exactly where you want them to go uh, instead of trying to find you know curves and whatnot uh, I think that the real art in in doing platforms along streets is how you handle folks with mobility impairments any thoughts? yeah yeah, I do. I, I think um, one of the things I would say is sometimes, um, you know, uh, BR, BRT is generally about sort of speed, um, right? It's about rapid, uh, providing rapid transit service. So it may not be exactly compatible with a uh, shared space. Um, and uh, in terms of its, uh, you know, that the intent is to slow things down. Uh, it's not to say that it can't pass through those spaces. For, certainly could, could be at the edge of them uh, is where boarding and alighting happen. Um, and, and that's where that curve could be raised because a lot of our streets the flush condition especially in Sulphur Springs is a good example of like it has to tie into a more conventional street um, so shared streets are not for everywhere and they don't go for miles and miles I would say um, you know they're they're about a sort of a destination um, so thinking about um, what is compatible and then um, how the length of it and then where your boarding and alighting could happen maybe adjacent or just after the shared space would be a recommendation Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, how, in what way should we be thinking about micro mobility with shared spaces? 
So all the scooters and the different uh, the different elements, Bicycles yes. Bicycles um, and either right. docked or dockless and how how do we how do we navigate all of that? Yeah, I might start Ian and then I know you'll you'll be able to contribute too if that's right. Um, yeah. So I think um, the the important thing is, um, you know, really, again, it's go it's going to the, the idea is to allow for every use to, to happen there, but there are um, good behaviors and there are bad behaviors. So how we design the street really, really matters um, for that and where we put place if there's dockless or um, uh, or docked um, scooters and, and bikes, um, aligning those in the right furnishing zone. Um, I know there are some communities that are considering red carpet zones, which are areas where uh, mob uh, mobility devices cannot be placed. Um, so they're areas where they're ex excluding, you know, those are these are frontage areas, places right adjacent to a building um, where you shouldn't park these. Um, again, it, it, you, you know, you would hope people would would respect that and place their, their dockless elements um, in the right spaces. So you can still clearly delineate, I think, uh, spaces within a shared space um, and ask for people to, to place them there. Um, in terms of the movement through that space, um, uh, you know that that we we grapple with that. I think in um, even in bike lanes at this point and on sidewalks, and um, there is an aspect that would still be um, a challenge, uh, frankly, for you know fast speeds or slow speeds. And so, uh, making sure um, it it sort of feels like if you've really claimed the street, if it feels like a place, behavior is better. And so again, that uh, reinforcement. I know we've said a lot, but the reinforcing design um, is is really helpful uh, for regulation. I think there's two parts. That's where you park things uh, when they're still, all the micromobility. Mm -hmm. um, you need to make sure it doesn't block sidewalks and whatnot in, in the right places. And then when they're moving, I think in shared spaces, it's pretty straightforward that they would move in the shared zone um, because the, the, you know, the, the behaviors are compatible. But in a flush street where you, you may have um, a, uh, issues on the side, if there's a lot of micromobility, you might want a separated bike facility and a sidewalk so that all the micromobility uses the bike lanes. And we're um, we're starting to think bike lanes are really becoming micromobility lanes, but not just for bikes. You don't need a bike lane and a micromobility lane. It all happens in the bike lane. And we're also talking about um, creating some guidelines to for the design of micromobility so that they have to fit a certain volume, that they have to operate at no more than 20 miles an hour with uh, assist, that there's no fumes, um, and that they're compatible in performance with the bicycle. So that all those micro mobility modes, whether it's a hoverboard or scooter, whatever it is, uh, can fit in there. Because they're getting invented all the time, and so we can't keep redesigning streets for every new one. So we're thinking, just give them some criteria, put them in the bike lane, on the flush streets and shared spaces. Shared spaces, I think we're fine. Okay, time's up. We had fun. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cindy and Ian, for, for joining us today and for the Urban Design and Preservation Division of APA for sponsoring today's session. Um, like I said, we will have a, a copy of this available on our webcast webpage, um, and a recording will also be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcasts on YouTube and we'll pop up. Uh, so again, thanks everybody and have a great weekend. We'll talk next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.